This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found on Gadget Geeks show number 414, recorded on August 29th, 2019. Here at Home Gadget Geeks, we cover all the favorite tech gadgets that find me. News reviews, product updates, and conversation, all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Carlson, broadcasting live from the Average Guy.tv studios here in a pretty warm today. But, Mike, uh, we've got a string of weather coming. We do have to say, listen, uh, for the folks that are in the south, especially Florida, but, uh, hunker down. It's going to get it's gonna get crazy for you guys there. We are thinking about you. Uh, positive thoughts, prayers, all those things going forward to you guys down there in Florida. We know the hurricane is coming your way. But, Mike, here in, in Nebraska, no hurricanes. It's going to be beautiful. So, you got to love Nebraska this time of the year, don't you? Yeah, I've had my garage door open, doing some outdoor products in the garage and able to paint the projects out in the driveway afterwards. It's been absolutely perfect with that garage door, but not too hot, not too cold. Yeah, you got to love this time of year. Exactly right. Especially for the first Husker game coming up on Saturday. Uh, it is. I think a lot of us are going to be enjoying the nice weather with uh, with a nice uh, Husker game going on. Ross Brand is with us tonight. Ross is out in the New Jersey area. Ross, you got to you guys got to be ready. I, I lived in New Jersey for a while. You guys got to be ready for fall as well, right? Getting there. It's been a pretty hot summer all around, and <laughs> yeah. we had one day. I think it was Monday this week where it was uncharacteristically cool. It was maybe like high sixties, low seventies, and it was like so refreshing. <laughs> it, it is Perfect. nice, isn't it? After yeah. You get, you get it to the end of a long summer, and uh, and fall is on the way. We. Always start the show, Ross. We always start the show with a little weather talk. I think that's like the Monday morning things people do when they come into work, right? They, right. For those who have to go in, everybody's talking about what you do this weekend and how's the weather. Of course, we post the show with World Class Show Notes. And a lot of Ross's information and a lot of things we're going to talk about today will be in the show notes. So head out to theaverageguy.tv. And then if you want this episode, it'll be slash HGG414. And those will be available for you as well. Don't forget, you can listen to us live on the mobile app. Um, if you are a home, regular home gadget, maybe if you're not, you can download the app for free. Android, iPhone, just search Home Gadget Geeks in the store or go to homegadgetgeeks.com. I have the link out there available for you as well. It's free and the best way to stream the program when you are on the road. Uh, we want to thank our Patreon subscribers who help pay for that every single year. Of course, that's a, a built Spreaker app, and it actually works out pretty well. So get it downloaded if you don't have it yet. Join us in our Discord group, theaverageguy.tv slash Discord. In our Facebook group, theaverageguy.tv slash Facebook. You can kind of see the pattern there. We want to thank you for doing that as well. I mentioned it earlier. Ross Brand is with it for, with us from Livestream Universe. And Ross, I got to hang out with you at Podcast Movement. It's super fun to have you on the show. Welcome to Home Gadget Geeks. Thanks for having me back. I believe it was episode 286 when I was on uh, the first time. It's great to be back. And yeah, Podcast Movement was so much fun and uh, really Getting to hang out with you and spend time in person finally was uh, one of the highlights of, of that event, which really is all about the people and the community. So I, I had a great time at, at Podcast Movement. I'm sure you did as well. Yeah, no, it was super fun and uh, good to spend a bunch of time with you. Mike, we got to figure out a way to have you show up at one of these podcasts. Apparently, I have things. to start podcasting for work, right? That seems <laughs> to be the trend is podcast at your workplace and I you get know. to go. We'll, we'll see. Does Carson have a – do they have a podcast? They are on the local radio here in Omaha, which then puts that out as a podcast. So, yes, they do. They record a radio show every Saturday. Um, they've been a little reluctant to do their own just special branded podcast because they have the radio show. Okay. Well, they, yeah, they should still do one. They should. I, I yeah. totally agree. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, so good. Tonight, we are going to focus on live streaming. And and the idea of this kind of is, is I think, um, Ross, since the last time you said about 280, what did you say? 286, I believe. Okay. So that's two years ago, maybe, do you think? I think, I think in time. Late, maybe late 2016. Yeah. And actually, a lot has changed in this space. And, and what I have found interesting, and a lot of us, you know, a lot of the, the people who listen to this show are uh, tech admins or tech support or have some kind of tech or are, are in charge of responsible for have influence over some kind of the technology that's that's happening in 2016, 2017. We were still this idea of podcasting. Mike, like you just mentioned, this idea of having a podcast at work was kind of still early. But I'm hearing more and more in Ross as we came back from podcast movement. I mean, 
at Gallup, we've been podcasting for seven years. I've been doing it via live via YouTube. We've been live streaming for a long time. So we were really early in the space. I, I don't know if there were too many enterprises out there uh, kind of doing it that early. But what I'm, I'm hearing, I'm seeing, Ross, this more and more where this idea of live streaming is coming to work. And then, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about kind of the platforms, um, this idea of Twitch uh, has really changed. Well, first of all, YouTube is the biggest platform for video and search ever. Like, it's just the king. It's going to be hard to catch it. It they're doing everything right on on YouTube. So uh, you know, we we, we want to kind of mention the thousand pound gorilla that's in the room. That is YouTube. Right. But certainly, uh, Mike and you flirted with Twitch a little mm -hmm. bit. Twitch has kind of come on. And it's really like I'm seeing this this idea of live streaming going mainstream. Ross, do you kind of get that feeling too? You're in this space. You work in this space. Does it feel more uh, mainstream today than it did maybe two or three years ago? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when we were talking two or three years ago, we were really looking at Facebook Live just having come on the scene. And I think that's what made, uh, you know, Periscope came along and then Facebook Live. And with Periscope, it was a lot of, you know, mobile phone and people playing around early on and just trying to figure out what is this technology and how do we do this? And then Blab came along and people started doing these talk shows that made it very easy. Of course, there were people doing uh, Google Hangouts on air like you were. And but this is where really it started to become more into the, the wider the wider attention on it. Uh, but at that time, like I say, Facebook Live was new, and I, I think Facebook Live really changed changed things because uh, when you went live on Facebook, all of a sudden, not only are you going live uh, uh, amongst people who might be interested in that type of content, but now your family and your friends are are seeing you going live, so they're becoming aware of it. And if you have a business page and your op people have opted into your business page, you go live there. Now it just became easy to sort of transfer that over. Okay, I'm going live talking about my personal life or sharing a moment. Well, I could do this on my business page, which is just a different click of the mouse when I go on to Facebook. And I think that's where it started coming into, into business for more people, starting with uh, you know, a lot of small business and solopreneurs and coaches and consultants realizing that they can answer questions from customers uh, and potential customers and clients right there in real time. And, you know, big business is some some have gone for it like Gallup has and others are still afraid of relinquishing that control and, and doing things unscripted. Mike, you've been doing this a long time with me on the podcast side. We've never not been on YouTube in the times we've been doing this. Like I, I was trying to remember, like, when was the first time I was on YouTube with one of these? It really goes back. Oh, I think we're in the 70s. But by the time I start going broadcasting live on YouTube uh, here, 70s. So 330 shows. No, is that right? 300. Yeah, 330 shows ago, which is a, a while. Mike, how what have you seen when we think about the streaming uh, just give me yeah. an overview from your perspective. How have you seen it change over the last couple of years? For me, the big change was, you know, in the beginning, right? We saw you stream and some of those where it was just the ability to live stream was a big deal, right? If you could stream live, if you could get your feed out there in the very beginning, it was who cares about the quality, the fact that I can do a stream live with video, right? Audio is a different beast. Um, it was done a lot earlier, but with video, I can get my video out there and people can view it. Uh, you know, the quality wasn't as much of a challenge. It was just getting it out there. You know, that was the big deal. And then it turned into, okay, how do I get this on more platforms that have more viewership, right? Because not everyone's on Ustream. People were on YouTube and things like that. So then YouTube got a hold of it. Well, then it, it's more of those. It's, it's where are the eyeballs at? They're on Facebook, right? And then Twitch became kind of the, the powerhouse for gaming, 
that's really where they got their edge was if you are looking for gaming content, you're going to Twitch and that's where the best gaming streamers are. And that's what they're doing. And I think so. So then it became more of a, you know, in, in these terms, a commodity, whereas you could stream wherever you want. It was relatively easy to do so um, back. I, I remember even it, Jim, it wasn't too long ago that when you and I were both doing our individual shows and then I was a co-host on yours, I was doing Uyghur tech we were using um, Wirecast, right? You had this really expensive software to do exactly what you're doing right now. You have each uh, of you and your two co-hosts, you have us in split views. You're able to switch back and forth. You can make Ross big. You can make me the primary. Um, I mean, you, you can easily with, yes, look at that. Look, you just made me big screen with a touch of the mouse. But all of that that you're doing right now is within a browser, and what I had to do was I had to do that in Wirecast back in the day. And I had to pre-program that into scenes and make sure I was I had the hotkeys going. And it, it was fairly difficult. So what we've seen now is, number one, get to where the eyeballs are, right? And Jim, I think the difference between you and maybe a lot of other streamers are when you, you already had your audience getting into the live streaming, right? So you, you had always been live streaming. But when it came to, hey, now Facebook is a is a player in this Twitter with Periscope, when those started to become big, you already had your audience. So you weren't necessarily looking to grow at a massive rate. And I still think if I were to ask you today, you're very happy where you're at with your numbers. You're not necessarily looking to grow as fast as possible. So for us, we have stuck to what works. We stuck to YouTube. We stuck to Hangouts on Air for as long as we could before that went away. And so you've got where are the eyeballs? That's number one. And then it's just features and usability and you look at Streamyard. i mean if this was around when i had been podcasting live this is i mean a mil this is exactly what i needed when i was using wirecast and wirecast was at that time a 500 hundred dollar piece of software if you want all the advanced scenes and the cutting and the lower thirds jim you are able to right now and we've done this in past shows you can take a comment from the chat and you can bring that in as a lower third i mean those sort of features on here look at that from Joe is that mixer, right? You can bring that right in to the show right here. That type of feature would have taken me a lot of effort back in the day with Wirecast. So I think nowadays with streaming, we've gotten to a point where the usability is there 100%. The eyeballs were there, right? We're, we're, we are where the people are. We are in Facebook. We are in Twitter. We are in Instagram. You know, I think Instagram's another great, the great platform for, for live. So now really it's, we've gotten to the point, and this was, again, the beginning stages of YouTube, if you think about it, were you just had to put out video content. It really didn't matter how good you were. It was put out content, put out content. If you look at the guys who got in early, they got a ton of subscribers really early because they were the ones there. They were on YouTube. They were the one giving tech content at that time when people got in. And now if you want to get in and you want to be a big player in YouTube, your quality better be there. You better have massive quality. You better have, you know, you better pay the money. You better use the soft. You better know how to edit because you can't just get on and, and put your voice out there and expect to get a bunch of viewers. So now I think things have changed where now live streaming is bring the content and bring the quality with it because now everyone's on the same level playing field in terms of easeability and where the eyeballs are at. Ross, uh, Mike mentioned StreamYard and we're using that. You can see up in the corner on that over the side. And I, you know, I like to leave that on because uh, it's, I like for folks to know what we're using. You're, you're, you're doing a podcast, a live stream. What's really interesting is we always came at this from a podcast perspective. We called all these podcasts. When you came along, you were calling everything a live stream. And I was like, why is he doing that? Right. But you're, you're, you've started a program uh, working with StreamYard uh, for this. Why? I mean, certainly Mike highlighted a little bit of the features that we have here, but why do you like StreamYard so much and, and what kind of features do you gravitate towards? Yeah, I, what I love is that, that StreamYard is finally a browser-based uh, platform or, or app that goes to multiple, you have a choice of multiple so, uh, social destinations. You can go to Facebook, you can go to uh, Periscope, Twitter, you can go to YouTube, you can have integration with Restream to go everywhere 30 plus destinations for free uh you can you can go to linkedin live now and you can also uh use rtmp to go almost 
anywhere uh, that accepts RTMP or anywhere that accepts, which is almost a- every major platform where the API is open. I mean, other than than Instagram, the the doors are wide open for where you can you can use this technology that you're using to produce the show. As as Mike was saying about Wirecast, not only did you have to deal with loading up all the graphics and creating them and, and all the switching to to get everything into place, but you had to have your guests come on uh, the half an hour early and you had to scrape the video and then put that into a shot and then crop in from the sides mm. and then the guest moves and you have to redo it. And then you, you know, you got to restart your computer because you see, so uh, Wirecast now has NDI from Skype, uh, and which, which enables your video to come in like a webcam video. If somebody, if it's on the same network, so we could do an NDI call and I could bring each of you in as your own feed, as as its own shot, just like I was bringing you in from a webcam, which has just changed the game for bringing in guests on Wirecast if you want to do that. But even when I use Wirecast, the ease of bringing in guests with a link means that I use the virtual cam to go from Wirecast. I can do a few things in Wirecast if I need to. But StreamYard is so feature rich and so easy to use that, you know, you hit upon it. It's it's the ease of bringing on the guest that there's just no comparison in terms of sending somebody a link. They show up and you bring them into the show. You take them out of the show when they're done. And that's that's really all the work you have to do. And then you can just decide what layout you want. And then it's showing the comments on the screen. Uh, both, uh, you know, it could be uh, banners as well, where you have question or you have a topic, you have a call to action. You, you can pretty much do almost anything, uh, because you can create overlays and you can create backgrounds. So you could create either a static image background, which could just be a color. You could use the home gadget geeks color right now. I think you're going with the average guy.tv black. But you could go with the Home Gadget Geeks green as a background color uh, everywhere where there's not a video feed showing uh, on the screen. But you could also use a video. You could make a a short video that loops and and use a motion background by uploading that. And you can do overlays, which could be anything from a 30-second video, 30-second or less video clip, to uh, you could do lower custom lower thirds. And just make it transparent with just the lower third having a graphic and text. And that could be present while your video is on. So you can do many of these different things. And I continue to learn, uh, you know, new tricks and techniques with this. And they keep coming out with new features day after week after week. And they all just work right out of the box. So I, I can't say enough good things about StreamYard. Well, that's been the magic, I think, or the advantage. Uh, oftentimes in business, the advantage goes to who's first. Mm-hmm. In With WebRTC and all these services, you'd mentioned Blab earlier. They've kind of come and gone. There was a few other ones in there as well. Um, trying to think, uh, besides StreamYard and besides Blab, Ross. There was like FireTalk, Huzzah, yeah. Yeah. Smile okay. something, Smile Time. <laughs> Yeah, there were a bunch, right? And I think this is one of those cases where they were all trying out this technology and it wasn't to their advantage to be first because uh, the guys at StreamYard have really nailed WebRTC. Like, mm-hmm. you're right. It's a link. I've been doing this a long time. It's a link. You send it to them. People connect. I Since we've started using this, I've had no trouble getting anybody to connect in here. So much so now that I think about StreamYard first for everything. I'm like, oh, even if I just want to record an audio conversation. I think I'm going to use StreamYard. I'm going to push it to YouTube as a uh, as a private link, so no one will see it when it goes live. And then um, I'll, I'll pull that video down, strip the audio out, and use it that way. Really, because the connectivity is so easy in the in the business world when we're using uh, Skype for business, or we're using Teams, or we're trying to use Slack, or we're trying to use Discord, and to get connected and get those things recorded is sometimes super messy. I mean, it's just as those are still old, old technologies that have these wonky, um, you know, okay, well, you got to dance and then tap on your head and tap your belly. And then maybe the recording will work. 
uh, kind of stream artists kind of fix that. I think we're going to see some copycats come along here, but, but this is, I think finally we're to the point Ross where the connectivity bit is so easy. Right. Now we got the barrier, Mike, or I mean, we've, we've removed the barrier, Mike, you mentioned screens, you know, the, the, the screen pieces are easy to do. It's, it's mm -hmm. easy to move people around. It's easy to get show, show full screen. So I think, um, I think we're to that point, right? Ross, you also mentioned uh, restream. Dot io right and so now right these companies have all these open connectivity or connections to them where it's super easy to make a connection within a, a really a kind of couple clicks and you know input some information and boom you are in broadcasting live to any of those platforms ross why do you think though i mean in your opinion for an organization or for a person with with streaming live why do you think the live streaming aspect is so important why why not just audio only in a podcast What's different with the video in your opinion? Um, I, I think it, there's a couple things working. One is with live, uh, people have just, and particularly the younger generations, they've just gotten tired of the canned messaging and the PR, the, the press release and the, the video that, that's clearly been shot with actors over and over again and the, the stock photos in the, in the career section with everybody jumping up and... <laughs> You know, not one of whom were actually works for the company. Yeah. So, you know, from the, the recruiting side of it, if you can actually share a little bit of the culture of, of the company you work for, and, and as you do with the coaching community at, at Gallup, when you can share a little bit of inside what's going on, a little bit of a connection with a person where they can ask you a question in real time and you can respond or they can call into your show, or they can come on live, or they can just see you giving some type of access that they feel special that somebody else wouldn't get if they were going through the PR department, or they were going through the, the uh, what was in the media about the company. They're getting a chance to see the people in what really is the most real fashion. I mean, it really is like, nothing else other than being with somebody in person. Now, you can you can prepare and you should prepare if you're doing a live stream on on behalf of a broadcast, you can choose who your guests are, which employees you'll spotlight, which customers or clients journeys you'll make front and center and a big part of the narrative that you you're telling. But ultimately, if I have somebody on and I interview them about what it was like to work with me, that's much more powerful than if I say, can you write a testimonial or record a video and send it to me? Because even as I'm walking them through the questions, people can tell with the body language, with the tone, with the inflection, with all those nonverbal and, and, and auditory, but not necessarily the exact words that they're saying. They can, people can read and sense on so many different levels yeah, this is real. This person really was excited to work with me or really did enjoy being a part of this collaboration. Whatever it is that you're 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 doing, um you you have a way through live to get people to share that in real time and in a way that just doesn't seem like it went through eight layers of of BS and I think as society is becoming more and more cautious about how they communicate within a business environment, within building a personal brand and all these things. There's something about seeing somebody just go on live where anything can happen. And you see how Jim relates to two different people and is able to interact and have a conversation. You get to see Mike in his actual studio background there where he's where he does his work. And all of a sudden, you really become much more memorable to people than somebody who's giving out a, a resume with black and, and a, a black text on a white background or, uh, you know, some type of portfolio that it's obvious that they went out and they had a professional photographer and, you know, they just called the best. In other words, you get to see the person in action and decide, you know, can the player play the game because you actually watched them in a game rather than 
read the stats and saw, uh, you know, the measurements and the, 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 the 40 time, right? Like if you're looking at football, you're going to judge by how the guy plays football, or are you just going to look at the numbers and, and draft the guy based on size and speed? And a lot of times teams do that and they find out that the guy really isn't very good at the part where it comes to playing football. Right. (laughs) Mike, you want to add anything to that? No, I I think you're totally right. And I think there are some podcasts that I have watched where I have gone and watched the live or even just the video, not necessarily live, but watch the video. And in just a very short period of time, whether the one episode, two episodes of watching the video, just like you said, Ross, I have connected with those people in a way that I hadn't before when I listened to just the audio. And I don't know what it is. It's, you know, it's, it's, we humans are wired to have that face to face contact. And I don't think, obviously, in person makes a big difference, but even just seeing them via video connects me more with them. And so, Jim, I think if I watched you, if I watched our podcast live or the video form once or twice, I think the way that I would listen to us in the future would be a lot different. Um, and there's pros and cons to that too, right? There are some where I've gone and watched the live video and the guy is way younger than I thought he was. And maybe sometimes I'm like, oh, now he doesn't, now I don't think he knows what he's talking about as much, right? Cause I, I see the age, I see the youth and I suffer from that as well. in everything I do where I'm a young guy trying to talk in my professional life as a lawyer, right? Like good luck to me when I, I do not like video chat as a lawyer, when I am conversing with opposing counsel, I try to avoid video conference as much as possible because they, they see me and they see a very young attorney and they think I can walk all over this guy. Right. Um, it's just, it's natural. It's not their fault. I don't blame them for it. I would have the same reaction I do when I'm watching podcasts. So, but I do think you make a more intimate connection. And I think most of the time for podcasts, it's for the better. And I think you, Ross, you nailed it. It's that connection. It's that behind the scenes, you feel like you have a deeper connection with them. And I'll be honest, I don't listen to too many podcasts from businesses, but I think when I do, and especially on YouTube, I watch more YouTube content from businesses. I feel like I've got to be behind the scenes access that no one else has before. And I haven't, right? Like that's, it's out in the public, but for some reason, I feel like I have better access than I do before. I think it just makes a much deeper connection. Whenever there's a video podcast that I listen to, I try and at least watch it or listen to it at least once or twice just so I get the vibe, I can get the feeling. And then going forward, I feel like I have a deeper connection when I'm listening to them. It, the numbers, I think, would say today, uh, audio is still king in a lot of ways, right? Now, YouTube's giving that a run for sure. When we think about some of the content, this is where the lines blur. YouTube is not just podcast content, right? It's all kinds of things. It's the vlogging. It's instructional. It's... It's um, it's anything. Like it's amazing what you can find out there, right? Um, and so that that really crosses uh, all of those kind of all of those genres. But so far as we think about the 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 content, right? At least for most people, their audio is still doing very well. But Ross, I get this feeling that man, video is coming on quick, and I think here before long, the the video will be king, and the audio will be kind of just a secondary bit. That being said, I have listeners who tell me I'll only listen to audio or no, I catch you live. And that's really the way I want to listen to you. So I also think there's value in doing this multiple different ways, right? When we do this, we're not only live to YouTube, but we could be, I'm not, but you are live to uh, LinkedIn live or Facebook live or Twitch or Mixer or right. These, these platforms that have gotten pretty strong. I think video is on its way. I mean, I think that a little bit of this, Jim, is is semantics because you and I are essentially doing the same thing. It's just that your audience is primarily a podcast audience with some audience, a loyal audience that likes to watch, excuse me, likes to watch you live on Thursday night. My audience is primarily a live audience, secondarily a video, video replay audience. Uh, not just the replay like in the next 24 hours, but we'll watch a YouTube video or or something in that nature. And then it's third, uh, the audio downloads are kind of the third option for, for my audience. But essentially, we're both doing our shows live. We're both recording them. We're both stripping the audio. We're both making a podcast. We're both m- putting them on YouTube. Uh, and what I advise people to do is even if they're doing 
if they're doing any type of short form audio, like, like a flash briefing or a, a, a quick podcast, uh, turn your camera on while you're recording it. Mm-hmm. And then you do you do the audio for the podcast for the flash briefing. But for social media, I, I don't think audio alone is really a scroll stopper. Now, people do some interesting things with um those audiograms and images but i think video in a facebook feed or an instagram feed is an eye catcher and if you just record just record video of yourself doing your podcast or your flash briefing and now you've got to take a 30 second one minute clip of that make a square video put some text on the top and the bottom and upload it to uploaded to YouTube. Now you've got content for all the different social platforms. Those video yeah. videos like that, I often don't put on YouTube. You could put them on YouTube, but they're so great for social that it's like, why not m- maximize the ability to promote what you're, you're doing and to bring attention to it. And in some cases, depending on the platform, you may upload the whole thing. If it's a short form piece of content and just figure, okay, I've got it in its RSS feed and it's being delivered as a podcast to all those channels, but why not let everybody on social media experience it? And on social media, particularly on a platform like Instagram, I mean, it's just very visual and having the visual there, even if it's people watching you record a podcast, people like that. They like to see what's going on in somebody's studio or what they look like or what the expression is. And I I think it's even double so for people who are mainly audio content creators, because people don't get to see them and they have a picture in their head of what it what might be going on when they're doing their podcast, what they might look like. But there's a fascination of, OK, now I can actually see them doing doing this thing. I just let me put the face and the voice together. It, it's a really neat thing. And I think anybody who does a podcast where they're audio only or does a flash briefing should at least try to just turn on their webcam and record while they're, you know, while they're doing their podcast, even if they're not live streaming it, but of course, live streaming it then opens up a whole nother distribution Avenue for getting your content out there. Ross, I, I a hundred percent agree because I think of, when I think of a podcast, how do you hear about another podcast you want to listen to? It's usually word of mouth. I'm not sitting there on the discover page of iTunes podcast, looking through, scrolling through. It's not a feed, right? And, but how many, so how many new podcasts have I subscribed to in the last year? Seven, maybe eight, right? And I found a really good ones that I subscribed to. I've listened to more than that, but I've really subscribed to seven or eight. How many new YouTube channels have I subscribed to in the last year? Probably goes over a hundred because, mm-hmm. you know, I'll scroll through Facebook and I'll see something like you know, a, a video they'll post. And I'm like, man, that's, that's really good content. Click over. It links me to YouTube and I subscribe because it's great content. It's the video, it's the visual. And really, to be honest, more than that, it's being where the eyeballs are at. Again, we're back to this. Where are the eyeballs? They are not going to a podcast. Like we can submit ourselves to all the podcast communities in the world. No one is over there scrolling those looking for new podcasts to listen to. And even when they do, what are they seeing? They're seeing your cover art and maybe that'll catch their eye. Maybe their title will catch your eye. But what is really catching their eye? It's on their social media feeds. It's a picture. It's a video. Exactly what you just said. I totally agree. Turn on your video because even if you don't do a video podcast, record the video. So that you can go back for those 10 seconds where, man, you were just on and you were nailing it. And you have a 10-second clip that you can post to Instagram or Facebook. You can cut that, use the video, and go. If you don't use any other video, totally fine. And and what is it to you? You can delete it from your hard drive later, right? right? But record it because even just this, you'd be surprised how many people, Ross, I see a video of you up there with you and your microphone in front of your face. I think you look pretty professional. And I'm and, and you have something good to say for 10 seconds. You got my attention on Facebook. He had a microphone in front of his face. He looked pretty good. He sounded great. I might click over there and subscribe. Whereas I might not find you in any other way if you're just putting yourself out on audio via podcast. So I think what you just said mm-hmm. is the winner for anyone trying to expand themselves in the podcasting space. And I think what's great about it is that using platforms like StreamYard give you an opportunity to easily connect your guest to record the podcast, whether you record it on a private channel, whether you 
uh, record it. Uh, you, you do it as a live stream and then record it. And and an interesting bit of news in in the Streamyard group is the the CEO Gage Vandentop of Streamyard mentioned that recordings are coming to Streamyard. So eventually, you'll be able to download a recording before it streams to Facebook, which we know that the quality when you download from Facebook is generally degraded and that the audio quality in particular for those making a podcast out, out of their uh, their live stream show, uh, getting that audio before it streams, which is why a lot of people record in a recorder or in their computer, yeah. uh, it's just much better. The, the sooner you get it, right, in the, in the chain of delivery, Jim, right? I mean, the sooner you get it, the better quality it's likely to be. Um, and so that's amazing that, again, another feature that a platform like this is bringing to the table that, I mean, just the possibilities. Now you don't have to run a screen recorder or recording software on your computer, which further boosts your CPU. And, you know, now you've got that recording saved for you that you can download. Uh, so it's just another, another uh, awesome feature and another reason that these platforms are becoming uh, really good enough to to do any kind of content on in a professional setting. I, you know, we loved Blab for the ease of it, and in some ways, video was actually easier to get started than audio because when you create a podcast for the first time, you have to navigate the whole what is an RSS feed and how do I sign up and how do I distribute it and why do I need a media host when I'm paying for web hosting and all these things like are a first time. So so Blab was like you press a button and you're live on video and audio. Uh, but realistically, the quality of the recording that you got from Blab or from any of those platforms other than Google Hangouts on air just were not up to the quality of platform that was uh, very much in the business side of things. Uh, Blue Jeans came along and actually had very high quality recordings. Zoom has always, to my imagination, been a little bit of a little hit or miss with its with its recordings. Uh, but now that we have the ability to get recordings from StreamYard, I, I imagine they're going to be very high quality. And they're doing different things with the audio settings so that you can record podcasts at a higher quality of audio as well. I noticed that there's that check mark box when you hop in that says disable audio something, right? Uh, processing maybe. And I, I've always wondered if I click that, Jim, like what really will we get better? It we, get a, we get a little better quality from you. Yeah. Cause they're okay. not, they're trying to, it, it, from my understanding of this, they're trying to compensate for any echoes. So not all, you know, we all have earbuds and headphones and, and, yeah, and great mics so we're and pro. like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's a lot easier. Not everybody has that. So when they're audio processing, they're doing some things to kind of do noise cancellation, right? Yeah. When right. you shut that off, it's just the raw audio. So yeah, actually for you guys, I should be telling my <laughs> audience, right? Am I right on that, Ross? Absolutely. So what happens is if I have I have a very quiet mic and preamp, right? So I may be talking and a guest is wearing earbuds with the little mic thing and they're jingling it in their jewelry. And it will actually think that for a moment the guest took over as the primary speaker and my audio ducks under the guest's audio. Uh, so this way it just whatever is is in the audio chain there along the way gets broadcast as it is because it's assuming as as Jim said everybody's using a higher level of professional equipment and understands how these things work. So for many people using the processing that's built in is probably the best way to go, but when you're ready uh this is a way that you know you ensure that the audio is is a little cleaner I think. And that's been the one the the only item for me that has the whole time right when uh, I've podcasted with Jim, I podcast with my co-host Colin. When I did my show way back, when we would do back and forth between a YouTube, uh, Google Hangouts, and then I would go Wirecast and Wirecast. Uh, Ross, like you alluded to earlier, we were doing via Skype, or I had him in studio. Most of the time, it was via Skype though, and I was screen capturing him. But man, the audio was so crisp because that audio was coming through Skype and going into my mixer. And then I was capturing all that locally, but even the quality that was going up to YouTube was him coming across Skype first. Mm -hmm. 
uh, which was high quality. You're taking my high quality XLR and you're just shooting that audio straight up. Where it, So in that sense for Wirecast going up, it wasn't having to do any audio processing. And once I did that, I got, that was the, that was the first episode, man. I got the most comments and emails back right. to me saying, man, your audio quality got so much better. And I was like, well, I mean, it, it comes with a cost though. Cause it's so complex, but man, yeah, I hear you. Like when I go back and listen to it, when I listen to Wirecast versus Google Hangouts, it was night and day. It was so crisp. Mm. Um, and even, you know, so you can tell the difference a little bit, but the convenience side was another side. I ended up going back because I'm like, guys, like I get it, but it's just too darn convenient to hop on Google Hangouts, just to hop on StreamYard. So anything right. that these services start doing now to give that sort of quality back to us on the audio side, because the audio on these podcasts, I think that's where that's where there's still a lot of room for improvement. I don't think many listeners care if I go a little bit blurry or if the screen switches around a lot, but in their car, when they hear, I mean, they're having to listen to that. And if it's painful a little bit to their ears, or if they notice a difference in audio quality, I think that's really where your listeners are going to notice. I think you should always focus on audio first, video second. And I think that'll always, you know, turn out better for your listeners because there are some podcasts I listen to and they are the best content in the world, but man, I can't listen to them because it is just painful in the car. Either it's too high pitched or I can't hear them and I have to crank up the radio too loud, whatever it is. And the audio ruins the experience, even though they have some of the best content I've listened to. Oh, yeah. Oh, audio. I like to say that audio is the most important part of your live video in particular when you're doing talk show. Yeah. type of content like we are. So obviously audio is going to be an important part of your audio when you're doing audio broadcasts. And like you were saying, I used to record everything in Wirecast. Like when I was just doing an audio, if I was doing something that wasn't live, I would always record it. If it was a podcast or a video, I'd always record it in Wirecast because the, the audio recording just from my mic into Wirecast or my mixer into Wirecast was fantastic. And now I use uh, Stre ScreenFlow, which is made by the same I, company. I love ScreenFlow. Yeah. I use that for, I record everything into ScreenFlow and it just works so well with, with Mac for getting a, a, a good, clean recording. Uh, but, you know, I, I think, I think the technology is, is, is improving. And I think really what StreamYard, what, what makes StreamYard different again is that we are having these conversations and not once has one of us had to refresh their browser or go out and come back in yeah. or turn their video off or, you know, hang on with us for a minute. We're checking the feed, you know, uh, and and there's other platforms that have brought some elements that we have here with StreamYard, but none of them have gotten this level of stability before. No, except Google Hangouts on air was extremely stable. But they had Google behind it. <laughs> they weren't a startup. They were Google. And they didn't have all the features that you have but here, they, right? They did not have yeah. these features. And I, I think the, you know, just the speaker being being prominent and everybody else in the little box uh, along along the bottom was getting a little bit of a, a dated view after a while. And I think people were ready for something a little more contemporary and a little more uh, a little, little, little more flexible in terms of how they can brand it and how they can, they can produce their broadcast. I do miss being able to drink my beer while Jim was talking without everyone being able to see it. That's the one thing I, I will say I miss about hey, I'm now and I'm like, I'm really self-conscious. I'm down here and everyone's seeing every time I go for my beer. I do wish there was an audio <laughs> mode in StreamYard that worked like Hangouts where Ross, when you were talking, you'd go full screen and then I would be full screen. I mean, I could do that now, right? I could switch over to this right now and be talking and blah, 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 blah. And then when you start talking, I can switch to you and Mike, I can switch over to you and we yeah. do that as well. Those, those will be my YouTube. I'll pick one of those to be the YouTube uh, <laughs> thumbnail now for that. But um, it is, um, I, I do, I, and the great thing about it is I think Ross, I've heard you say some of those were continuing to work on this platform and some of those things are still coming. Okay. I want to change the subject a little bit on this. The, frustrating part I have, I just mentioned this. So Steve Sleeper, who's a listener to the show and listens to Ask the Podcast Coach on Saturday mornings as well with Dave. Um, we, uh, he, he made a video for me and he was like, hey, Jim, uh, love your videos, but here's a few tips if you want to actually get anybody to watch them on YouTube. You need to change your thumbnails to a picture 
not your album art. I'd always use my album art so people would see it on YouTube and go, oh, that's Home Gadget Geeks. I was more interested in people having that brand recognition than I was the thumbnail recognition. But apparently you don't get recommended if you have boring album art in there. Okay, second, uh, we talked about this early in the show. Okay, if I'm going to do this thing out to, to LinkedIn or to Instagram, I need to embed the closed caption or the, you know, you got to have it in there because a lot of people watch this thing when they're in the bathroom, uh, yeah. wh right? Whatever. Or, you know, later at night. work in a meeting. Work. Yeah. They don't know exactly. And they want to yeah. read the words, right? Okay. Something else to do. Oh, so that's on those platforms. Um, if I'm going to go to Mixer uh, or Twitch, I need to engage in every single conversation that comes in. Mike, I watched you when you were doing your Twitch channel and it's really important there that you don't ignore your, your audience. They come and they want to be recognized. Right. And I just get overwhelmed. In fact, I even told Steve, he, he was so nice to send me this note. I said, I'm probably not going to do anything you're telling me to do. I just want to be, I want to be real clear. I'm probably not going to do any of it because there's so many things to do. Ross, I, with the, the proliferation of all these new uh, services, comes all these different ways to optimize them as an, as an influencer, as a YouTuber, as a podcaster, I could literally spend my whole weekend. And I think you do, to be honest, Ross, <laughs> I could spend my whole weekend just optimizing my content on all these platforms. How do I make sense of all this? There's so much that you can do that you could be working 24 hours a day, seven days a week and not hit everything. I mean, you can, there's so much you can do to optimize, to promote, to uh, make a better experience for somebody somewhere yeah. that you, you ultimately have to look at what, what works for the majority of your audience and what's going to get you good enough results. Uh, obviously, if you have a team with some people, a lot of people have teams who are, who are social media influencers and big podcasters and live streamers. And so they can easily say, here's a list of 50 things you have to do after a broadcast. Well, 35 of them are being done by other people. So it's easy to, it's easy. It's like easy for you to say, exactly. You need to do all these things. Yeah. Um, but clearly I, I've, I've taken it slow with YouTube, but I treated YouTube as an archive in the beginning. I'm going to take my, my, shows and i'm going to upload them to youtube and i had no idea how youtube works so sometimes i would upload 20 of them in a day and publish them not realizing that if any of them had a chance to breathe and get some some momentum i'm i'm just totally cannibalizing all of them i didn't put description like the headline was you know the name of the person i interviewed which unless that person's famous Nobody's going to be searching for that person. I didn't do tat the whole thing. Like I did everything wrong you could do. I know. So I know. I've started focusing now on uh, most of my, 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 my nature, my shows have changed. So instead of doing an hour interview with one person, I often have multiple guests. Say I have three guests. So each get within each guest, there's a segment that I can pull and make a YouTube video out of. So I'm, I'm being, Thinking about what can I do as far as the title goes, what can I do as far as the description goes, and what can I do with the thumbnail? Are yeah, there a few other little tweaks? Maybe. But those things alone, when you get a template for the thumbnail, and then it it's just playing around with pieces, and even that, even that takes time. It it, it's taken me like 40 minutes. Do I put the logo here, or do I put their logo here, or do I... You know, oh, this 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 person's letters or their name is long. Maybe it's like it, even that takes a long time. Tough. But that has made a huge that made a huge difference for me. It would probably make even a bigger difference for me if I only focused on that content, which has a history of doing well. Uh, but I'm still treating my YouTube channel in part like a portfolio where I'm showing people what I've done and what I can do. So I may interview somebody on a topic that I know isn't going to gain a lot of views based on history, but it's still nice to put it up there. And it's part of making a good relationship with your guests. And uh, so, so I'm kind of caught in between of like, okay, ideally this is what you do to optimize your channel, but then 
I, okay, I'm not trying to become famous on YouTube. I'm just trying to have a nice channel that serves me when people want to find out more information about what I do. So I walk a, a middle ground. But optimizing your titles, your tags, your your descriptions, and your thumbnail covers can make a big difference. And if you were just using a plain thumbnail cover and using the episode epi the episode number and the name of the guest or whatever, just picking a title that somebody might search for, like, you know, how to live stream with StreamYard or how to how to go to, uh, you know, uh, live streaming updates for 2019 or I know I so resist Ross. Something like that let can me, make a huge difference. Let me just be honest with you. I so resist this YouTube clickbait. Like, and I know people tell me, like, no, 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 Jim, you're going to have to play the game. If you want the YouTube juice, you're going to have to play the game. And I get, I, I, I Mike, you got to talk me off the ledge here on this one. Cause it's like, I don't want to change these titles. I don't want them to be, and you'll, um, you'll never believe what happened next. And I don't want my listeners or those folks who find me on YouTube to do that. But apparently if I don't do that, there's no discovery. I don't know, Mike, well, what, what do you think? Two things. Number one, you're not looking for discovery. <laughs> you have your audience and you're putting out video for the audience that you already have to find video if they want it. And number two, we're not, we're not the clickbait. If I, if you, the instant they click into that video and they see an hour and 10 minute long video, they're, they're already gone. It's not going to work unless you put in the extra work of, of making clips, right? How do you, uh, you know, what's the best streaming service? And you clip the eight yard where Ross just talked about, you know, stream yards like that. And you clip that and you make it and you do all that extra work. And that goes back to number one, if you want to build an audience. And I think it depends on what you want to do. You, YouTube for you is more of an extra outlet to get your media out there. If you're an, if you're a hundred percent YouTuber or if you are a hundred percent media, this is not your livelihood, Jim. You're going to, your family is going to eat just fine. If your podcast doesn't, doesn't grow very well. Right. But if you are, there's plenty of people and they are a hundred percent right. If you are trying to grow your YouTube, because that is your bread and butter, uh, you better follow those techniques because you need the views. You need the eyeballs. You need the ad revenue. You need the subscribers. But I think it's just different. And I think a lot of podcasters, Jim, are honestly in your shoes where YouTube is the video outlet. It's just It just happens to be the most convenient place for you to upload your video to for people to go and watch it without costing you an arm and a leg. This would cost you a lot if you had to host your own video and have it be accessible for people to go and view in a, in a manner that's great, in a manner that works well. Um, so I think it really just depends on what you're trying to do. So I think it depends on the podcaster. If this is going to be your bread and butter and if YouTube, you need to make it and you're trying to grow your audience at a massive rate, follow those. Clip up your podcast and put them out. Use the clickbaity titles because as much as you and I hate them, they freaking work. <laughs> I am on YouTube every night and I even within my category space, right? I'm really into ham radio right now. I'm really into woodworking right now. And in those two spaces, how to make the best, in the is capitalized, the best finished cornhole boards. That gets me to click instantly over yeah. build a build yeah. tutorial for cornhole boards 101. That doesn't get me. It's how do I build the best? I don't know why. It, it just gets me like those sort of titles. They work and, and, and uh, they do. We're really only talking about YouTube here. Ross, I'll turn it to you in just a second. I mean, sure. now multiply that times Facebook, Instagram, Twitch. 100%. Like, you start you, you start working your way. And I guess I'm saying these as the average guy to say, hey, you know, maybe you're listening to this right now and you're thinking, you know, I've, always, I've kind of been thinking about doing my own fill in the blank podcast, YouTube channel, live stream, whatever. And you're thinking, I'd kind of like to get into that. Ross, we just, we could actually spend the next three hours just talking about YouTube optimization. And, right. and uh, there's all these other channels as well. I mean, it's just, it's kind of madness, don't you think? Can I get back in on the YouTube thing for one yeah. second? And, <laughs> See? And that is, I think there, we have to look at there being a middle ground between doing, being, not doing anything with your title to draw attention and yeah. clickbait. Okay. Like clickbait would be, you know, why you'll become one of the world's most sexy people if you live stream. Yeah. But, you know, if if you have a title that's, you know, about the state of live stream, you know, something that, that at least yeah. let somebody searching for 
what's going on with live streaming, how to do live streaming, what's, uh, you know, the, the, the best platforms for live streaming. Um, I think that's fair within, I think you have to figure out what's within the video that you're being honest about that you can put a headline in a way that somebody would be searching for that. Yeah. No, I know. But I think the news store, look, the news, the most credible mainstream newspaper you want to pick, if there are any left, uh, they write headlines to get you to read the article. I know. I know. And they're, they're dealing with very serious subjects, subjects of life and death, war and peace. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and, and they're still thinking about how do I write this headline? to get people to read and and more than ever actually because of uh, of so much media going online they're now measuring clicks mm. all the newspapers are measuring clicks now they're all writing headlines based on what's going to get clicks uh but it, it's not really clickbait if you you're not delivering what's because i've clicked on a lot of videos expecting to see one thing and i got something totally different or it never happened or it was one second of a 15 minute video but certainly titling this around something with live streaming and podcasting and i i don't think is out of line <laughs> well and i think there's a fine difference between you're right you're totally right click bait i think the definition of that would be baiting you into something that's not what it actually is whereas a catchy title um this guy maybe didn't have the best way to finish a cornhole board surface right but that's what he titled it and when all i searched in the search bar was building cornhole boards and this said right. the best way and so i mean is that clickbait some would debate i mean maybe it is maybe it's not maybe he didn't have the best way but it was a catchy enough title that it got me to click on it so i think the searchability people aren't searching the 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 catchy titles but when they search for how to build a cornhole set and you have your set of titles there it's probably important to have something exaggerated Right. Or I don't know. The truth of it is, is hard to debate, but I think you've got to be a little bit exaggerated or clickbaity in order to get the views. I, I think that's just the nature of YouTube nowadays. So, so I'm looking at my YouTube feed right now. Like, okay. you know, these <laughs> yeah. are recommendations for me, which is a little right. scary. Right. Or look I, at your history. That would be even more accurate of what you actually click it's on. It's kind of eclectic, but it's, I, I, as I look at my, the things that I watch, right. Yeah. Um, I watch a lot of history videos and there's this one eastern front of world war ii animated 1943 to 1944 okay no clickbait no like there it's just a straight title it was the that. only video on that topic that was it out is 1.3 <laughs> million views oh, that's a good that's a good right? point eastern front of world war ii animated and so I fight a little bit against this. This is it's these kinds of things that make me fight. Now, there's a whole bunch of other factors out there as well. But Ross, this makes me fight that title thing. Like um, uh, when I was when I was chatting with Steve uh, this weekend, he didn't like you know when we had Aaron on. I I thought it was cute because I used the hashtag Van Life in the title uh, to do it, and that also gets me thinking. Like I need one title for the podcast, and I need one title for YouTube, and I need one title when I put it on Twitter, and I need one title when I move it to Instagram. Right? It's like. Uh, Oh my God, how much do I have to think? But anyways, <laughs> I see a title like this on YouTube and I kind of buck the trend a little bit, Ross. I'm kind of like, but, you know, 1.3 million views on an on an animated Eastern front of World War II? Seriously? But Jim, Jim, think about this though. The title wasn't History Episode 302. No, you no, no, still right had on, right a way on. to search for it. There were yeah. still keywords in there that you would search for if you were interested in that topic and you you also um I, if i if i had the video but I, i'm not going to do it in the middle of the show but I, I could look and see did they tag the video what did they put in the description they're, they're, true no you're, you're and, right and there's, there there's, so there's you're, other you're right. factors yeah. but still at least if you were searching for that subject you would be you would come up with it and probably it got recommended maybe they even yeah. boosted it with some advertising in yeah, the beginning yeah. we there's so many factors that no, no, right are on, complicated right on. and and certainly i'm i'm no expert on 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 youtube on the youtube algorithm i mean you could you could spend your life studying that and then it changes the next day and you've got to play catch up to get up there and and, and stay on top of the latest and 
you know, there's still, I, I've always believed there's still no better SEO than creating great content. It's, it, it, I, I don't know yeah. that, 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 that's a little simplistic because there are people who, you know, create great content and are getting no eyeballs and there are people who are creating mediocre content, but they know how to work the system and they're yeah. doing pretty well. But in general, uh, you can put all the clickbait you want to, but if you bring people to mediocre content or content that they're not looking for, that's really going to be the only click they're ever going to give you. Right. Well, and I, I don't know. I agree with you in certain ways and I don't, right? Because I think in my mind, in this space, it's quantity over quality. Hmm. I think in this space, it's the more you get in front of them, the more they're conditioned to see your videos. And does this cost money in promoting your videos? Yes. But, you know, some of the things I think about is, for one, um, Gary Vaynerchuk, massive titan in uh business entrepreneurial if you're an entrepreneur you know who gary vaynerchuk is and half of his videos i don't think are very good but you know what i kept seeing them over and over and over and over and over in my feed and and they were all different it wasn't the same video over and over that over time i'm like okay he's got some okay he's, he's got some good stuff and then i kept watching and watching and i actually started to like his mediocre stuff more and more as i started to watch more of his videos like it's this weird conditioning of just seeing something over and over and his titles are clickbaity so he gets a lot of engagement on youtube and he went for the quantity over quality space and his videos are short to the point he's got captions he does a really good job of he even puts his own video timer on the bottom so that when you don't see your own video timer it's got a red thing going across the bottom so that people know i mean it's it's that kind of sub i mean he and he's a marketing agency that's what vayner media right. is they're marketing so he knows the human perception uh but man does it work and, and when i look at someone like that i think i would love to say that it's quality over quantity mainly because that's how i personally put out put out stuff is i want it to be quality mm -hmm. i'm not quantity I want it to be good and I want someone to find it and say that was worth it. Give them a subscribe. Um, but really, I think in today's age, I, it might be a little bit of a little bit more quantity. Now, do you need to have quality? hundred percent. Like you need to have it eventually. Um, but it may are be you, more of I'm sorry, flooding their, their that, feet. The, that the content, like what he's saying really is mediocre or yeah. are you saying that the quality of the video, you know, the, what the he's saying, quality, not right. So, but he's built a cult of personality in a sense. And I don't know. He's found some way to dig into people and get them addicted to his content and what they're saying. But that's what, what I mean. Saying. That's what I'm saying is how do you get that initial flood of people? Mm. Is it quality or is it quantity? And I think he chose quantity over quality where it's just flood them with stuff. Get it out there. Go, go, go. Eventually we'll hit a nerve of something that that person likes. And they'll see it. So I think there's both ways. I think you and I could probably, and we could try both of these and probably have the same level of success. That's the crazy part about YouTube right now. Um, but for me, what I've seen in the people that I have watched the most, they went for the quantity over quality route, yet they still had a base level of quality, right? You can't just be a total awful producer who gets, who puts out hundreds of videos and gets views. You have to have some semblance but you're not going to appeal to everyone. I think that's what people like Gary know is they're, you're, I'm not going to appeal to everyone. So what do I do? I blast out there as much content as I can, content, content, content. And eventually something's going to catch a nerve and they're going to come back and like, Oh, this guy's got decent stuff to say and, and hit that subscribe button or, or whatever it is follow. And then instantly he, he's, he's kind of formed this empire <laughs> over time. Oh, we could talk about this for so we could. Had this, a fun listen, conversation. We've had this. Have, this yeah. has been about a thirty-minute conversation, especially on YouTube. It, when if we took it to Instagram, if we took it to Twitter, if we took it to, it'd be different. I mean, uh, well, no, they would all be different. This is this yeah. is this goes back to my original conversation. So, which gets me thinking, like as I think about my workflow for this, I I, I probably and and to Steve's point. I kind of need to start thinking through maybe a little different way of doing it and using technology to my advantage. Right. So there are in knowing some Google Analytics around the space that I'm in around the keywords. Right. That mm -hmm. might be a little bit helpful. Having a podcast title because it doesn't matter. The title doesn't really matter very much on a podcast. Most people have subscribed and they're just going to listen. I rarely look at the title for the podcast <laughs> that I listen to, but it totally matters on YouTube. And so 
one of the things it's frustrating is I think I'm creating a great title. And then somebody's like, eh, and you know, you're like, Oh, is that, you know, uh, I thought that was a great title. So, right. you know, you, that, that kind of, that part is frustrating. So, and I think there are some technology Ross in this space that could help me. I just need to build it into my workflow a little bit different. If, if now to Mike's point earlier, we do this, Mike and I do this for community. Like I am not really worried about, I, in fact, I told Steve this when he sent me the video, I don't know, really know if I would even want a hundred thousand subscribers on YouTube because most of them are awful. Like they're awful, awful people out there on YouTube. Right? <laughs> they're just terrible. And I don't know, and I, I can handle the stuff in the chat and the comments and, and those kinds of things. Do I want to like, do I want my audience subjected to that kind of brutality and have to defend me and the channel? Like, I'm really happy. Most videos for the Average Guy Network get uh, a comment or two, and it, it's really nice to have them. Now, I get hundreds of views or maybe tens of views instead of 10,000 or a million or whatever. But for me, it's a, I don't know, it's different. I, I'd, I'd like to write, run this out to the audience. If you're listening either on YouTube or maybe you're downloading the podcast, I'd love to hear why you listen. And we've had this discussion and you're like, oh, how does this relate to gadgets? <laughs> well, maybe this is more along the lines of, our, of some survey research we're doing a little. We didn't intend to do this, but a little survey research as we talk about uh, as you, the listener, what are you listening for? And obviously, if you stayed around for 400 episodes or what, however long you've been on the podcast or watching it here on YouTube, you've got something. Send me an email, jim at theaverageguy.tv. I'd love to dialogue around with you a little bit about that. Ross, I am going to, like, this has got me kind of thinking like, okay, I'm going to be doing this for a while more. Maybe I need to think about changing my workflow just a little bit so I get the, I maximize those, but again, I don't, I don't know if I want them that big. Right. I mean, so I don't know, Ross, any, any thoughts on any of that? You should be so lucky that you make a little change in your workflow and all of a sudden you get a hundred thousand people. If you do that, I want to know what that tweak was, but well, no, you I, never know. You never, I, I've, I have YouTube videos with tens right. of thousands of viewers on them. So we've, we have had that. I, I think it's, it, it's, it's minor adjustments and it's, in other words, having a title is better than having no title or a number as a title. So you don't have to put four hours into coming up with the perfect keyword title, but have a title that reflects what's in the episode. Probably there'll be a keyword within those words that somebody's searching for. You'll pick up a few views. You'll maybe you'll get recommended a couple more times if you want, if you even care about that. The other, the other thing for promoting the podcast, I, I would say take one video clip. Make one, just start with one video clip of under a minute from, from the episode. 30 seconds, 45 seconds, a minute, could even be 20 seconds. And upload it to each of your, your social accounts. Upload it to uh, LinkedIn with a link to the podcast. Upload it to... Uh, Facebook, link to the podcast. Put it on Twitter, link to the podcast. Upload it natively on each each of them. Uh, upload it on Instagram, link to a podcast. See, see after doing that for a month, does anything come out of it? Maybe, maybe it excites people who are already subscribed and following you but haven't listened in a while and pulls them back in because... Now they're seeing you and they feel connected. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what the result is going to be until you try it. Yeah, that's, no, that's it. That's but good th advice. By the way, I appreciate that. One, but that's doing one that. video and just trying to distribute. Now, yes, uh, the, the, the social media guru would say, you know, understand the context of each platform and do something different. But then they've got a, a team member for each platform. But yeah. just try try that. Because now you're giving a visual element and a video element and your uh, highlight for people to look at. Yeah. Start with that. Take us take the screenshot that you use for uh, your YouTube thumbnail. If you use a screenshot from the show, the next tweet you send out, send out that as the image that goes with it. Now you've got another unique piece of content. If you can make a night into a nice square or something, there's another thing you can post on instagram yeah. or make it put it as an instagram story 
with a link, you know, link in bio kind of thing where you put the link in your, your Instagram bio, you put it in the story, say, uh, hear the episode, link in bio, whatever. So there's little things that you can do that, that won't take a ton of time and, and can you can see, does that move the needle at all? If it doesn't, then stop doing it. If it does, then decide how much it is and is it worth doing more of that or is doing it once a week at least accomplishing something for me? Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's I think that's good advice. Uh, doing one thing, you know, we, you say, like, do one little thing, just one little change. The problem is, is those little changes over a time – Right. add up to a bunch of time. Like, I, I mean, I post, and it's worth it. I post my audio to every single free podcasting platform that's available, right? You know, so we go to Spreaker, we go to Pod, uh, Podomatic, SoundCloud, MixCloud, Audio Mac, Shout Engine, Archive.org, Podcast.com, um, now Anchor, now uh, the new one, Launchpad. Oh, so you think, t literally, that's maybe a minute to upload those, set them, get them right, get them done. By the way, if you want to listen to them on any of those platforms, you can. <laughs> iHeartRadio, Stitcher, <laughs> it's it's horrible, right? But that being said, it takes that takes maybe an extra 15, 20, 25 minutes on a Saturday uh, to to get all those done, and you and that starts at that time starts adding up. I I don't I'm not disagreeing with you. It's just it's a struggle in technology. Mm -hmm. We have access to this is the golden age of this in a lot of ways. And there are so many platforms and so many things to do and such great automation. I think about tools like, so I need to open Canva and and get a take my graphic. First find that graphic, take my graphic, put it in Canva. Once that once that initial image is in Canva, then I could easily make one for YouTube, one for Facebook, because they all have different size dimensions that they want, mm -hmm. right? Uh, one for Instagram. But okay, so I'm now 30 minutes into a graphic. It's probably going to take me, oh, 25 or 30 minutes to find the right clip out of this. Pro Again, I'm not complaining, but <laughs> I'm just saying like, you know, to the to the clip, okay, now I need to find clip. I'd love to be able to crowdsource all this and say, hey, what, what does the crowd think the title should be? Or mm -hmm. what does the crowd think the clip could be? It doesn't really work. Like that, the, right. that is, is, is something that doesn't really work. Pretty soon, um, I'm Saturday morning, my routine is, you know, I run all the video, upload it to YouTube, upload it, process it, get it done. And Saturday morning is the, the actual post. Mm -hmm. And I spend an hour before Ask the Podcast Coach and maybe an hour or two after Ask the Podcast Coach. It's two in the afternoon on Saturday mm -hmm. and I'm still down here, mm -hmm. you know, posting the podcast. So anyways, again, not complaining. It's just one of those things I need to continue to find technologies that make that easier for me uh, to get it posted. And the chat will will help you in that if you look at the chat and you see what what from the show people are talking about. Then, then what what brought a lot of comments that can often give you a clue of where in the show to go to look for your clip. So when I was doing Streamyard Connect on Wednesday, I noticed in the chat there was a lot of talk about the Reddit and live streaming because I mentioned the story about Reddit testing live streaming. So that's the first clip that I went to was a clip of me talking about Reddit. Figuring if that triggered talk in my chat, that would trigger interest on the different social platforms now when i go pick the second clip it, it might have a different reason that i pick it but um you, you know or just something funny i i don't think you have to watch the whole thing right you you yeah. you, you were well, you did a nice job but your show is just you and you segmented it right like right. we've we've now had a 45 minute discussion on youtube titles and how to optimize those <laughs> and i'm not exactly sure like finding that that five minute clip in this show is pretty difficult sometimes i mean it's not an easy i don't control the conversation we started the show with two real long real long monologues by both you and mike like you right. talked for a while then mike came in and he talked actually i think mike you started and then we came over to ross those are long those are hard clips to break down into you know and it's just you have to physically listen to them and then kind of get that figured out. It's about a six to one ratio, right? If you're going to edit audio or video, it's going to take you about six times the actual length of the clip to get it right uh, when you're when you're cutting those kinds of things out. So again, not complaining and just talking about the workflow. Oh, we've got all the technology to do it, right? I can drop it into Audacity or I can 
put it into, I still use Windows Movie Maker, which is just ridiculous, but I do. It works for what I do. And I can go through and slice those things out pretty easily, right, but it's, right. it's still a little bit of work. I guess I'm used to, from my years of working in radio, I'm used to doing it in, on deadline. So it's like, okay, here's the cut for, you know, he, I, I, it, it, the politician spoke for an hour or the coach yeah. spoke for an hour. Here's the news. Like, right. this is the news or this is what's going to get people talking or this is what's event. Cut, <laughs> cut, <laughs> go. <laughs> yeah. Get it in there. So uh, not that I do it that quickly. Believe me, it right. takes time and you got to, you got you want to edit it right and you want to edit out you know if the person says repeats if they say i i'm going you want to yeah. cut out that first i there's no reason to make your guest look silly it's starting so but yes there's a lot of little things that take time you want to make sure that there's a coherent thought that it can stand on its own all, all those things but i think it's I think you could do it quickly if you if you said you know you started watching back you you watch your shows back anyway or you listen back anyway I do I do so somewhere along the line you just I usually don't listen to them for a week or two later oh okay yeah no I need to get clear of them this is this is this is what people will want to hear all right on um uh, Justin in the chat room here let's 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 use the tools that we have available I think this is really good so he says. I asked the chat room, okay, chat room, what, what should we title this? And he said, streaming, branding, the YouTube, the master class. Wow. <laughs> and I do, right? Well, that, you know, is there, a, the master cool. classes are really catching on uh, on YouTube, right? They've got that whole series around it. I might change that to live streaming, branding, and how best to use YouTube, the master class. That, again, Everybody has their own idea on what title should be. And and um, I don't think I am really that good at titles. Like, I, it's just, I think there's a little bit of an art to that. And I think there's a little bit of nuance to it. And you say, Ross, you say, oh, yeah, just kind of the things you talked about. And, you know, there's some of these kinds of things and keywords. And I'm like, yeah, that's not that easy. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, fortunately, we use otter.ai now to do all our transcripts for the show. And if you actually go to show notes for the shows from, oh, I don't know, maybe the last six weeks, you can actually in the show notes, go down and click on the, you'll see a timestamp in our show notes now. And if you click on that timestamp, it'll actually take you in the audio to that exact spot we're saying that. So I don't, I haven't really talked about that very much, but if you're a regular listener to the program, that's available to you um, as well. A little bit of really cool technology getting, you know, getting that part done. And it gives me some keywords. I mean, that's actually saved me some time of like, what did we talk about? It goes through and pulls some keywords out and and has sped up that part for me. So maybe it's just learning uh, oh, the the workflow through like through Canva. What's the best way to get my album art? Like, so for this show, Ross, mm-hmm. what do you think? And Mike, think about this as well. Your your Mike, your bandwidth went really wonky. On oh, did it? Yeah, yeah. So okay. while you're fixing that, Ross. If you were going to use for this show, you, if you were going to use a, 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 a image for YouTube and maybe what else, what, what would you use for it? How, what, what would you, my, my, my indication is I have a full scale picture of you. Cause I, I did this a couple times in the show and I got you smiling like you're doing right now. Right. <laughs> and I could do that and put, you have a nice little spot to the right there where I could put, you know, live streaming ninja ross brand in there right i that's that's kind of what i would do but what would you do well i have i have a certain sort of template that i use for my youtube thumbnails and they all have the title uh, like you know trying to hold it to four words or whatever five words most the title and some people say never more than three words but i i have the title and, and then i have an image of the guest i have an image of myself uh and i'll have an image maybe of the product if there was a product of their company logo um so so i i okay. mine's just that it stands out so like if you're scanning down the, the thumbnails the title stands out big and uh that that's i mean i'm yeah. not doing anything special with it but yeah. i'm doing more with it than if I, I just <laughs> put bl- blue, you know, my yeah. my my website color blue, right. and the name of the title or whatever, and right. and didn't think about it. So I'm doing, uh, I'm adding like maybe one little 
kind of emoji looking, whatever those things are called and sticker kind of thing. And, you know, uh, if I'm talking about podcasting, it might be a headphones next to whatever the title is, or just a little something that's eye catching, yeah. but I'm not yeah. doing anything special with it. All right, Mike, uh, you're the chief millennial here. What, what, what would you do for this show? Jim, I've been, I've been the naysayer. This is why this podcast has been killing me. I've been like this negative Nancy the whole time. <laughs> and, uh, because what I want to say here is it doesn't matter because yeah. for for people who aren't subscribed to a podcast, I see a clickbait title. I click in and instantly I see anything longer than, I mean, I want to say 30 minutes, but for sure an hour, yeah. I, I'm back out because yeah. I know I'm not going to find what I was looking for yeah. in an hour 45. And honestly, I don't have an hour 45 to devote to any <laughs> YouTube video I watch, right? So for me, if you're a YouTuber, and you want to get content out there and you're going to spend the time to think about titles, to think about keywords, categories, chop it up, make it segments because, yeah. um, yeah, no, put, right. put, definitely put your full video out there for your listeners. Like, like for me, right. I listen to, um, ham nation by twit, the twit network. And for right. some reason, I really like to watch the video side of that because they show a lot of really cool setups people have for their ham radios. I download the hand, I download the video or I watch it on YouTube. Yeah. Put it up there because your subscribers will appreciate it. I'm talking about for growing like and but for your subscribers your title could mean absolutely zero for your listeners. For your subscribers like you said Jim for the shows you subscribe to, for the most part people are going to listen no matter what. Now there is, you know, there's some there are some shows that I only listen to the certain catchy titles I listen to, but I think Jim for YouTube, uh, chop it up. If you want them to listen for, for this specific beer, if you're talking about uploading the entire hour, 20 hour, 30, even 45 minutes, 30 minutes and above. Um, I, I don't think it matters. Uh, you might get a few, right? Yeah. You will get a few more listens of random people who have that amount of time to listen but I don't think you're not enough to make a difference. I don't think uh, it's worth your time. Okay. It's, it's good advice for us. I've been the naysayer this whole time. So no, I feel like, I, I you know, it's, it's, it's the opposite side. It's the millennial, no attention span, yeah. um, yeah. time frame kind of person who's, who's given that advice. R Ross, this is a, so I'm throwing up a little bit of your branding that you're doing. Right. And this is, I, I view you as a hybrid between what I do and what all the rest of the YouTube community does. <laughs> Right. You're you're in between. In other words, you have consistent branding. So when I look at your, like if I'm on YouTube and I see, I can tell when I'm coming across your content. You have a consistent font that you use. You have a consistent color that you use. You, break, like I can tell very very quickly. That's kind of what I was looking for in my, when I was putting my logo on there. Is I wanted folks who knew me to go, that's Jim's video, and click on it. Right? Maybe Mike because of your point, but Ross. Uh, I do anything you want to, we are, we're going to, we're running a little short on time here, but sure. um, any, any thoughts you want to highlight on this uh, graphic that you put up? I mean, I think you pretty much just said it. It's consistent branding. Um, I make sure that the font is large enough so that, you know, words that people yeah. are looking for, they can easily see against a, a white background with black letters against the white background, but the picture of my guest, a picture of myself a picture of one of the products that we discussed and the logo of the company. Uh, this was somebody from Electra Voice, uh, for people listening on the podcast, is somebody from Electra Voice that I interviewed at Podcast Movement. And I titled it Great Microphones for Interviews and Studio. And while that certainly is better than an interview with XYZ from Electra Voice, which doesn't mean anything to almost anybody, People looking for, you know, what's a great microphone to use or what's a what's a microphone for interviews and or for my live stream studio might come across this. And undeniably, Electro Voices RE20 and RE50 are outstanding industry standard broadcast microphones. They're in every radio station, you know, pr pretty much across the country that doesn't use a sure SM7B. I mean, so yeah. it, it, it's not like I'm I'm making up something and then, you know, I'm, I'm putting a, a, you know, $20 karaoke microphone up there. I'm actually putting a, you know, top of the line microphone that 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 we talked about in that that interview. Yeah. 
Joe, Joe says, I, I appreciate that. That's a good, that's a great example. And like I said, I think a hybrid Joe had said earlier when we were talking about titles, you won't believe how this show <laughs> will improve your live stream brand. <laughs> yeah, a actually the won't believe he's, I, he's joking. I take out the won't believe. And this could be the title of this, this, this could be how to improve your live stream branding. That's probably, and I, for me, I'm in the podcast title. I'm going to probably put with Ross brand. Like I want that. I do want that in my title. One, I want to visualize it for my own. I like to go back through my own archives and actually I usually put my guests first. So I'd say Ross brand talks about improving your live stream branding. That would probably be the way I would do it, not caring what the title things are, but the way I like to do it, that's just for me. So I don't know. Uh, probably more people are searching for live streaming or branding than they are searching for Ross brand. I, I would say. Yeah. Maybe one day it'll be different. Now, <laughs> well, but I don't care. Brand, now You're the, more board, now the board brand kind of works because yeah. because it's now like this word that's used everywhere in marketing so yeah. by accident people may be searching for the word brand uh but ross brand is not going to be searched for as much as live streaming or podcasting or youtube or yeah. marketing or branding or media <laughs> yeah so no yeah. right on uh we're getting some kudos out in the chat room as well fred said really enjoyed tonight's show jim and so or brad said that uh, yeah, appreciate that, Brad, in getting that in. It's a little bit of a risk to run a show like this, uh, Ross, in some ways, because it's not gadgety. Although we do a barbecue show and we had a whole show about alcohol last week. So <laughs> uh, I basically do what I want. And that's kind of the way I've approached the branding on Home Gadget Geeks is I kind of just do what I want. And, and that's hard. I think it's hard for some people to understand sometimes. It's like, Guys, I actually do this. I know this seems weird, but I actually do this for me. Like I, for me to spend an evening with you, Ross, and Mike every week with you, it's a real treat. Yeah. And, and uh, it's kind of an excuse. Uh, Dave says this. Dave Jackson says sometimes says this. It's like, where else do you get the opportunity to have this kind of conversation? And yeah. we record it and other people get a chance to do it. I really give to, I can't say that word because it's family friendly, <laughs> but. I really, I really don't care. I almost did. Um, I really don't care if it goes big on YouTube or if we're massive on LinkedIn. Now, I have that advantage because this is a hobby podcast. At work, it's a right. little bit different. At work, I've got a whole marketing team that kind of cares. Uh, we had talked about, I mean, they do. I shouldn't say kind of, they do. But um, we have, we're replacing some videos uh, and they, they made some new videos. We did some old videos about eight years ago and they're just hokey and they made some new ones out of the stuff I made. And so they did repurpose that stuff, right? They took theme Thursday content and repurposed it and it's dynamite. So there's mm -hmm. some great things to do there, Ross. I want to thank you again for one, for hanging out with me uh, at uh, podcast movement and two, for coming back and uh, coming on here talking about live streaming. Thanks for doing that. Well, thanks for having me back. Love the show and always enjoy it. And it, it's great to be back. And thank you for hanging out with me. That was uh, that was a blast. And hope to see you again at, an, at another conference soon. And uh, we, we do the same thing. It was just a, a lot of fun experiencing podcast movement with you. Yeah, it was super good. I appreciate that. If you want to catch more on Ross, you can catch him on StreamYard Connect 2 p.m. Eastern out there on LinkedIn, best to follow Ross uh, out here because LinkedIn still doesn't have the best subscription system to do those. They're still in beta for live streaming. So head out to linkedin.com slash IN for LinkedIn. That's how it's, and then slash Ross brand, just like it sounds. You can catch uh, Ross on StreamYard, streamyard.com slash Ross. Well, that's kind of cool. It's really just Ross? You have that Ross. That's you're that important. Well, that's my landing page for people okay. who are interested in StreamYard. <laughs> that is super cool. Facebook.com slash live stream universe. You can find them there as well. And then we will have a complete list of where you can find Ross in our show notes. Head over to the average guy.tv forward slash HGG for home gadget geeks four one four. Mike, great to see you as well. Thanks for coming out uh, tonight as well. Good to see you. It's always a good time. Always love it. We'll remind everyone and thank the Patreon subscribers who each and every month uh, support the network. And we appreciate you guys in what you do. We have one in $5 plans if you want to head out there. The average guy.tv slash Patreon. Don't forget to join our Discord group or Facebook. Just the average guy.tv slash and then Discord or Facebook. If you want to send me an email, jim at the average guy.tv. 
We want to thank Maple Grove Partners for their sponsorship of uh, of the whole network, the Average Guy TV network. Get high speed hosting from people that you know and you trust, reliable as well and super fast. Of course, you know that's Christian, and so you can get more information, hosting plans as little as ten dollars a month, media and web hosting, and it's pretty great stuff. Uh, if you're going to do use GoDaddy, don't. Okay, MapleGrovePartners.com. We'll get that done. We are live every Thursday, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, out here at theaverageguy.tv slash live. We'll be back next Thursday. Mike, you and I, we're actually going to have to carry the mantra next week. Catch some folks up on what we're doing in our technology world. Maybe talk a few cigars. With that, we'll say goodbye, everybody.